Alien 3. An audible original drama by William Gibson. Starring Michael Bean and Lance Henriksen. Dramatized for audio and directed by Dirk Maggs. Although edited for television, tonight's thriller contains scenes of suspense and violence which may be unsuitable for young viewers. Parental discretion is advised. Excerpt from the May 1992 cover dated Premiere magazine. The article Mother from Another Planet by John H. Richardson. Seven years passed between the first alien and the second. Six more years would pass before the third was ready to unreal. It's a little like childbirth, says Sigourney Weaver. The first couple of years after you make an alien film, the idea of doing another one is not that appealing. But this time it was supposed to be different. Producers Walter Hill, David Geiler, and Gordon Carroll jumped back into their alien franchise almost immediately after the second one was finished. Hiring cyberpunk author William Gibson, they showed him a brief treatment set in a Soviet space station and asked if he had any ideas. It was sort of like a cold war in space, with genetic manipulation of the alien replacing nuclear wars, says Gibson. He set to work, but he was interrupted by the 1987 writer's strike and regime changes at Fox, and finally decided to go back to work on a novel. Only one detail survived. In my draft, this woman had a barcode on the back of her head, he says. In the shooting script, one of the guys has a shaved head and a barcode on the back of his head. I'll always privately think that was my piece of Alien 3. Somebody like Siskoid, he's made his appearance on the show. I have no expectations expectation that he's ever going to appear again. He, he might, but the intention was when he said that the one miniseries he read when the books were coming out was high, I was like, well, he has to be on that episode, so that's a guarantee. Whereas you've been on multiple episodes and the expectation is this should not be your last episode either, although there is an element of finality to it since we've been building to Alien 3. But since that's the arc, I kind of want to go back to that place and look at some of the, the podcasts that we already did with other people because you were buying those books too. For instance, you were here for, what was it, Alien vs. Predator was last time you were here? I think so, yeah. Okay, yeah, like, you did like, Earth cause, War. Cause we, yeah. we talked about Earth War and we talked about the Danny Bouvet miniseries and all that and then and then yeah and then we talked about alien and predator okay and then were you buying dark horse presents and reading the stories that took place there like advent terminus countdown reaper i know you had me back on that one show where we talked about it and this is not a hundred percent true but if alien three issue number one of the adaptation is like my end point with alien comics which is not entirely true but like for a good number of years the end zone of all the alien dark horse comics i've read i I feel like listening to your show has filled in any gaps I was missing. Does that make sense? Like, because, yeah, I get you. Because we, we did that one show where we looked at those short stories, all the Dark Horse stuff. Like, I had never read those before we discussed those. And then what you're asking about. Well, you like, like first that you'd said, if I remember correctly, you had expressed an interest in covering genocide. So you yeah, read that one yeah. that was coming out. Oh, and yeah. Did, we yeah, didn't yeah, talk yeah, about read, how you talked about that one, though, did we? I thought it was fine. I mean, I, I don't know. Like, like I it's it's it, to me, like, it's weird because what I what I I guess it wasn't as memorable as the other one I kind of committed the Denny Bouvet for first miniseries like that I sort of committed to memory and took to heart and all that kind of stuff and then Earth War had Sam Keith so I like it's like I remembered sort of what happened to it even though we you know we kind of revisited the stories and and you know I had to reread them and everything so I'm sure if I reread genocide I'd be like oh yeah I remember this I remember that the main thing that stood out to me about about that was all the what Arthur Sudam covers or whatever like that. I, I think I tried to replicate them when I was a kid. You know, I tried to draw, you know, the alien on that, I think, first issue cover where he's blood's dropping out of his mouth and, you know, that kind of thing. Or like, I, I think I tried to replicate like the um, what was it? Was, was it Kelly Jones that did the hive? I remember like the covers, you know what I mean? So it's like, I, I guess to answer your question, like, w w did I think they were as great as the other? They, they didn't have the same impact on me. I don't I don't necessarily think they were bad or not good, but I I, I guess for me they weren't the, what was the, the the stuff I'm remembering about this stuff is the covers more than the actual, you know, story within it or whatever, I guess if that makes sense. As I've mentioned many times on the show, most of this material I'm coming at either new or I, at the very least I didn't read them in the time of publication. But I do think that there's a bit of a mounting quality. It's like you got the first mini series is the first time anybody's done anything with alien incredible artwork on that this is a book that's been reprinted many 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 times mm -hmm. so obviously there's love there then we go to the Den Bovees miniseries and again fully painted art full color for the mm -hmm. first time the, all the fetishistic elements that we both you know glommed onto and we talked about previously so that feels like it builds then you get to Earth War Sam Keith is like the only image caliber artist to ever do Alien 
begins while in their mm. prime period. And of course, this is the end of the story arc. We finally get Ripley after all that time. So again, you get that sense of building. And of course, it's the Earth War. You know, just the name alone is like, oh my God, the Earth War. And then you go from that to the introduction of Predator to comics and then Aliens versus Predator, which is, of course, monumental. They made movies about this, right? Not good movies, but they made movies about this, right? Right, right. And then, right. like, you go to, like, Dark Horse is obviously the stopgap. So Dark Horse is the play, the comic, Dark Horse presents is the place where you get the guys that you can get to kind of keep things going. But you still end up with a story by Simon Bisley, another big yeah. time guy, one of the only guys from that period that got huge, that never really had, like, didn't, didn't go the image route, but he was one of those guys you had companies like Black Ball built around who he was hot enough to where it's like, we could launch our own image with a guy like Simon Bisley. You know, it, it wasn't true, but you could understand where they were coming at that from. So after all that build up, then you get to genocide. And I feel like that's maybe where the, it slips the clutch or something because yeah. you don't have name brand creators. You don't have the Trinity from the, the movies anymore. Downshifting from, okay, well, we had the Earth War, but now we're recovering and we're dealing with the problem and stuff. I think that uh, genocide is maybe like the Ghostbusters 2 of the Aliens comics. It's mm. like, oh, well, you know, then we lost all of our money and now we're playing children's parties and you're like, wait, what? you're kind of doing all these backflips to get back to the place where you used to be because you maybe like got things got too hot and now you're kind of chilling them out somewhat artificially it feels like I would say. And, but then I think that you get Hive and because, of, uh, especially because of that uh, Kelly Jones Art who's another guy who's yeah. a, a yeah. pretty big name gushed about that when we talked about it and uh, you know, things got, their schedule got a little screwy but also you had the Tribes graphic novel and you've got, you know, the novella with painted art by Dave Dorman so everything up to this point still, with the exception of genocide maybe, feels like it's still a big deal. Feels like yeah. it's a milestone. Yeah. Feels yeah, like yeah. it's an event. And I think genocide is the only one, with the exception of, again, as, as has been mentioned, iconic Arthur Saddam covers, or Sidem, I don't know how you pronounce it. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe I'm wrong. As you say, people, I don't, I, I, don't, I don't know either. I, I think it was si uh, Brian that came up with Sidem. I never looked it up. I think past the covers, there's not seemingly a lot of impact with genocide. But all these other ones still feel like it's, it's like, this is a, a, a pitivity of uh, a franchise. This is a Tiffany licensing opportunity, you know? So you, I think that there was a, a feeling of that heat giving momentum going into the, the movie Alien 3. So I was wondering, as somebody who's reading more of that stuff, you know, at the time for, period, like how you were responding to, like, did you read the Tribes hardcover, for instance? Or, or did you get it in softcover? Like, I couldn't have afforded the hardcover, if, you know, even if I had been reading it. I, I, I feel like that would have been too expensive. And I think my, uh, my unfortunate predilection is... Like, I, I don't like comics that are pros, like, like when it's fake comics, you know, like that they, my brother, know, like they're, they're, my brother, remember I, I, Ryan had to drag me kicking and screaming into that. I will be, I, make I, my book, I, my book and my comic, a comic and never the twain shall meet. For me, the, the most torture, like not that it's torturous, but the most torturous part of the reading the greatest Batman adventures or the greatest Batman stories ever told, you know, I loved like every comic in that, but then there's that one, I forget what issue it reprints, but there's the one where it's all it's like beautiful i think i think it's marshall rogers pictures or, I or say, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're talking about the one i think of i think it's actually dick giordano it's oh something maybe about, it's it's something about crime okay. alley if I remember correctly yeah, yeah. And it's like it's like there's just this wall of text next to it and i'm just kind of like you know i don't know i'm 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 a duty head i i, I don't even like reading books anymore so oh, like all that stuff the, the nightwing you know, secret origin oh i don't know i don't like that stuff so my suspicion is i probably saw an ad for it went oh wow look at that cool art and then realized like one it was super expensive and two it was like a lot of text so i was just going like eh, I, I i i'm pretty sure i did not own and or read that as it was coming out like i i, I remember buying hive i remember buying genocide i remember you know i remember buying all the main big mini series maybe not so much some of the like the some of the stuff we discussed the advent terminus and the the little dark horse presents stories but the the big mini series in real time i remember reading I, I guess to answer your question, like, I mean, clearly I must have been into it and there was a, a certain level of momentum building up to the film, right? I was excited enough to go see it. Excerpt from the June 1992 Cinefantastique magazine, volume 22, number six. William Gibson's Neuro Aliens. The cyberpunk genius behind Neuromancer wrote the first of many Alien 3 script by Sheldon Teitelbaum. Acclaimed science fiction novelist William Gibson had big plans for the third Alien movie, whose script he was first commissioned to write. So did producer David Geiler, who signed the Vancouver-based Pope of Cyberpunk.
steampunk after reading a copy of Gibson's award-winning novel Neuromancer on the beach in the se- on a beach in the south of Thailand soon after the release of Aliens 1986. The result was not as memorable as either hope, but the experience is recalled warmly by both. Another sequel, Maintain Guiler, had to be sufficiently different from its two predecessors so that there would be no danger of it being reviewed as a mere retread. Gibson's cyberpunk sensibility believed Guiler was just the kind of touch that was needed. Gibson noted that he was similarly influenced by the film Alien 1979. I think it influenced my prose sci-fi writing because it was the first funked up dirty kitchen sink spaceship and it made a big impression on me. When I, when I started writing science fiction, I went for that. Alas, by 1987, when Gibson was called upon to craft an Alien 3, the cyberpunk aesthetic, already ensconced in music, videos, and advertising as a cultural cliche, had lost its sheen for Gibson. In Gibson's script, Geiler got a more conventional political face-off, based upon Geiler and Hill's ideas, between the Weyland yutani Corporation and an equally corrupt constellation of non-aligned third universers. Gibson noted he was enormously impressed with Hill and Geiler. They were arguing at the time about what the alien metaphor meant, said Gibson. I expected this kind of discussion of subtext from academics, not from producers. Hill, in fact, argued in favor of a subtext which viewed the aliens as cancers, not so Geiler, who believed they worked as a metaphor for the HIV virus. Geiler had heard someone on the radio say that human life on this planet had developed as food for viruses. Gibson liked the idea, and his script became the only one of a score of others to explicitly incorporate this theme. Still, Gibson found himself hard put to grasp the vagaries of screenwriting. A master of surface textures, Gibson noted that he'd wished he'd been hired instead as the movie's art director. If you look at my style as a novelist, I'm heavy on cultural detail, said Gibson. That's really something, as I've subsequently learned to a certain extent on other screenplays, the province of the art director. In screenplay, you only want a little telling detail. I was writing down what people were wearing and how their watches functioned. Hill and Goddard's original concept was to confront the company with a separate, space-faring Earth culture of a socialist or even communist bent. It wasn't clear to Gibson or anyone at the time how quickly the concept would date. We got the opposite of what we expected, said Geiler. We figured we'd get a script that was all over the place, but which would have many good ideas we could mine. It turned out to be a competently written screenplay, but not as inventive as we wanted it to be. That was probably our fault, though, because it was our story. We had hoped he'd open up the story and didn't know why it didn't happen. I was glad to have something to hang on to story-wise, responded Gibson. Being given free reign really meant an infinite budget. The impression I had, though, was that budget parameters argued against introducing the aliens into something that was the equivalent of the Blade Runner set, which I admit would have been my natural impulse. Failing that, I worked through a series of semi-abandoned space station ideas, my favorite of which was a space station that seemed to be a shopping mall under construction. I've always found unfinished shopping malls extremely spooky. The most fun I had with it, though, was working out this kind of futuro-socialist third-world culture that seemed to be in opposition to the company, but in fact was just as corrupt. It's like the crew of the Enterprise running into a spaceship full of Stalinists. We're talking arty science fiction novelist attempts to come to grips with cinema form. The TV guide synopsis would read, Space comedies hijack alien eggs, big trouble in mall world. It's not a script I'd want people to use to judge any screenwriting talents, but my imagination has been trained in the course of writing a couple of sci-fi novels to move in a particular way. You, you remember that Marvel adaptation of Terminator 2? Oh, it's amazing. I was literally thinking about that exact same thing. Like, like, uh, like that, that. It's like I, I can't. All I can tell you is I was that, super by the way, excited. That was, that was Klaus Terminator. Jansen, right? If I remember correctly, it was like a two-issue yeah, gla- yeah. Klaus Jansen miniseries. Uh, yeah, because was, my, my brother bought that one. I, I, I read his copies. I, I was super excited about Terminator 2, just probably, I, I don't know if it was the same level, but I, I'm sure I was anticipating Alien 3 as well, right? And and I kind of feel like both those miniseries, I think they're both like three-issue miniseries adaptations too, like coincidentally, but I don't like them. Like, like I and it's weird because you're like, oh, well, like Klaus Jansen is not, you know, is is not a, a, uh, a creator that somebody, you know, uh, does not like, right? Like, it's oh, not, no, 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 it's not, I, I, it's I, not I, somebody definitely who's I'm, not well I'm, thought of. I'm but, perfectly, but that, I, since, since we're going down this road, I, let me put this out there. Because uh, I've, I've shaded Klaus Janssen many a time over the years. Um, okay. I agree with people who say that he was one of the great inkers of the 1970s. And obviously his work with Frank Miller in the early 80s was seminal. I, it, you know, I, I will not detract from what that man could do. Like, I love Gil Kane, like pure, unadulterated Gil Kane. But if you're going to have somebody go over him and like uh, assimilate him and turn turn his transform his art into something different from what it was Klaus Janssen is one of the best people you could point to because they did some just incredible covers together where it was just this merging of styles and he just brought so much to Gil Kane's artwork now it, it's I, I like both I like Gil on his own and I like Gil transformed by Gil, Klaus Janssen and that's not always the case but uh, I, I'll, I will completely attest that when Klaus Janssen is bringing his A game and especially in his prime 
years, he was like a force to be reckoned with. But also, as a person who w- was not as keyed into comics history in the mid 80s right. and stuff, right. going from Mike Zek on the Punisher miniseries to those fucking shitty, awful, <laughs> like the, the early issues of the Punisher ongoing series that Klaus Janssen drew was the first time, uh, coupled with and more hubristically, uh, some of the uh, latter Bill Sienkiewicz New Mutants uh, issues. Where as a kid, I looked at it and was like, I can do better than this, you know? And obviously, I know better when it comes to Sienkiewicz at this point. I'm not so sure that if I didn't apply myself, I could draw those Punisher <laughs> comic books better than Klaus Janssen drew them to this fucking day, okay? That stuff is fucking terrible. And I realized there's some stuff stylistic choice in that but also his stuff just looks like chicken scratch and you don't need a fucking art school major to draw the fucking punisher just like you don't well, need that for the terminator uh miniseries and once again my brother bought those early issues of the, Ter- the punisher he we yeah. were both into it at the time and he had more money than me and he had access to a comic shop so i would read his klaus jansen issues the punisher i read his klaus jansen adaptation of terminator 2 and they fucking suck and they were not yeah, what i wanted yeah. as a child as a t- target demographic for those comics in that time klaus jansen fucking blew it yeah the the terminator 2 adaptation um is like it, it's worse than those punisher issues man it's 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 bad like it's really really bad and i get i think i think it's there, there, there i guess i'll come at it from the vantage point of m- maybe there's something about that that's unfair because i think when you're dealing with movie adaptations there, there's some level of expectation that the the that it reflects the fucking movie it's adapting right like and and klaus jansen is not somebody that can do likenesses you know it's like just putting a mop of hair and some little blotches and making some guy look like a little klaus jansen has trouble with with semblances much less likenesses yeah it's i you know it's like you know it's all very superficially like oh this is this is eddie furlong it's like you know, like it didn't. I don't is, know. Is this a but, midget or is this a child? There's there's some ambiguity yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Excerpt from the May 1992 cover dated Premier magazine. The second writer, Eric Red, near dark, was hired in late 1988 for a five week job intended to coax more development money out of Fox. Working with director Rennie Harlan, he turned in his draft in January 1989. As he remembers it, he came up with the gene splicing idea. In the third film, you needed a new alien. I suggested doing genetic experiments on the alien. Red says that Hill and Geiler were disorganized and irresponsible. They had no story or treatment or any real plan for the picture, he says. Hill and Geiler say the problem was Red's script. When Harlan read it, he quit the project. Excerpt from Development Hell. In their quest for a big buck sequel, Vox went through a dizzying array of Hollywood screenwriters and directors by Sheldon Teitelbaum. After Gibson's first draft was rejected, Hill and Geiler introduced the novelist to Rennie Harlan, then slated to direct the picture. Gibson declined further involvement because of other commitments, however, and it was decided this time to go with a big-name screenwriter. And your A-list writer director Eric Red, who had crafted The Hitcher, Near Dark, Blue Steel, Cohen and Tate, and most recently directed the horror film Body Part. Red's script introduced a new protagonist, a special services commando whose platoon is wiped out by the alien when it boards Ripley's now lifeless ship, seen adrift at the conclusion of Aliens. The alien is brought aboard an orbiting space outpost populated mostly and illogically by redneck farmers. The company, in conjunction with the military, conspires to tame the beastie, but in a scene seemingly lifted from Robocop 2, not to mention King Kong or Mighty Joe Young, the alien embarks on the standard slaughter fest. It then turns its attentions to the surface, where the terrified townsfolk are mounting a posse. Neither Hill and Giller nor Fox like the script, despite Red's introduction of a new kind of alien, one which takes on the physical attributes of its host, in this case a cow. Sigourney Weaver didn't like the script either, mostly because she wasn't in it. It was a disaster, said Giller of Red's script. Absolutely dreadful, and that was the end of both of them. It's weird timing because I, I recently, uh, yet again, revived a years old podcast I hadn't touched. This is the comic reader resume where I talk about comics I read when I was first starting to collect comic books. And one ongoing theme of that show is that I bought a lot of movie adaptations as a kid, at least the first issues. And I still can't tell you exactly what possessed me. I think part of it is the same thing that drives this podcast is that you're trying to find more opportunities to spend time in a certain universe and it's with a certain group of characters or back in the days before there were VHSs, at least I had access to them. You you couldn't reliably know when Buck Rubanza was going to come on television. So if you wanted to, you know, uh, revisit that material, the best yeah. opportunity was was either going to be the prose novelization or a comic book adaptation. And again, the whole Dark Horse model was that there was a time when you would do a Conan or Star Wars and it would be the biggest
biggest thing in comics and could save a company from bankruptcy. But by the 80s, that was being less and less the case. And Dark Horse was one of the few people who came along who actually put effort into their adaptations and did good quality work. But also the circumstance that always lend themselves to doing that. And again, you know, Klaus Janssen, who I figure got more or less kicked to the curb on Punisher since his run on that book ended up being like, I think, four or five issues. And then they started bringing in uh, fill-in guys before they finally landed on Wills Portacio. And so the ne- one of the next things he does after he's off of Punisher is Terminator 2 adaptation. And by that point, everybody's got a VCR or everybody's got cable. And it's just yeah. nowhere near the necessity to have this, this extraneous material. And, you know, more or less Marvel, they still did adaptations going deeper into the 90s. But you could tell that the effort was less and less. You know, they throw a Rob Liefeld cover on a Mission Impossible adaptation and then some no-name asshole on the interiors. I don't know who did that particular one. I'm not trying to slag on them. But you could tell that the only time you were going to get a, a one with a, a quality artist is because they were somebody who couldn't keep a deadline. And so they, they didn't care about throwing them the bone of, okay, you need you need to make rent this month and you don't want to kill yourself. Here, you can do the Stranger Days adaptation. You know what I mean? Right, right. Yeah, I. it's weird. It's it's kind of like it's kind of like that that aspect of how annuals like used to be special and then they just became like kind of dreck that combined to form a giant dreck story. Excerpt from the May 1992 cover dated Premier Magazine. Next up was David Toy, Warlock. His draft was set in a penal colony in space and all concerned agreed that it was very good. There was no Ripley in it since Hill and Goller planned to leave Weaver out and bring her back for the fourth film. At that point, Joe Roth took over Fox and when he read Toy's script, his response was swift and irrevocable, says Toy. This is a great script, but I won't make this film without Sigourney. After talking it over with Hill and Guiler, Weaver agreed to do the movie if she liked the script and Toy sit down to write her into it. Then came what Toy calls one of the most transparent bits of studio treachery I've ever heard of. Back in New York, Hill saw The Navigator, an odyssey across time, a stunning but esoteric art film by an obscure New Zealand director named Vincent Ward. Hill got Fox excited enough to call Ward, but Ward said he didn't like Toy's script. No problem, said Fox. So I hopped on an airplane, says Ward. And during the flight, I had an idea that was totally different. Sigourney would land in a community of monks in outer space and not be accepted by them. The monks would live on a wooden planet that looked like something out of a Hieronymus Bosch, with furnaces and windmills and no weapons. Ward pitched the idea to Hill, Geiler, and Roth. It was a little far out, says Geiler, but that's what we wanted, to push this thing a little bit. Ward signed on in April 1981, and Fox hired screenwriter John Fasano to work with him. We were supposedly writing Alien 4, Fasano recalls, but if ours came out first, it would be Alien 3. Fox wanted to start the movie in October. Across town, says Toy, I'm writing balls to the wall, and about two weeks before I finish, I got a call from a Los Angeles Times reporter. He says, what's this about competing drafts of Alien 3? You know, I, I was thinking about this, and I, I, I this, this might be a dovetail, but like, you know how you you wanted to talk about that um, alone story or whatever, and and that's from a, a card set, and like the card set is like kind of j- just like you were talking about, just like like this movie adaptation and, and Terminator 2's Marvel movie adaptation was kind of an anachronism in the present day already. Like I feel like a card set of Alien Three, you know what I mean? Like like it's like it's like when when it, there's, there's cards for like Batman and Batman Returns. You're like, OK, you know, but by by this time, what is this like? Is this 93? Like, like, it's kind of like, come on, man. Like, you know, you, you're kind of like, who the fuck gives a shit about Alien 3 cards? Right. But well, I'm, I, I'm I looking... think my, my argument would be it's sort of like the Solaris card set. You know, it, it's, yeah, it, yeah. people talk a lot about how Kenner put out the big alien figure in the night in 1979 and how mm-hmm. deeply inappropriate that was for children. And I think that it was I don't know if it was one of our commenters or somebody else's a show I don't even remember but there's one kid who talked about I think it might have even been uh, was it Chris Franklin maybe where they bought him the, the figure and it scared him so bad they took it back and of course this uh, is the priceless heirloom years later or would have been right, but right, but right. It, it was too scary and it went back to the store instead um, that, so that we talked about there's a lot of jokes about that but I think there's jokes we made too about oh you know this this weird art film kind of thing a t- approach to a, a property let's do the trading cards that people are going to put in their bicycle spokes it's like no, 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 this this wasn't that. So it's also just the wrong match of merchandising and material uh, with regard to this movie. Like, no, you don't you, you, this, you don't wrap this up with some bubble gum. You know, this is not that kind of movie. Yeah. And I guess I guess the reason why I brought up the card set was the one thing I noticed about it was in between all the photo stills and, you know, the, 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 the separate art story and this and that. In between that, there's like these file cards on each of the prisoners. And I, I, I don't know why. I got this weird flash of like, like, you know, I was trying to, uh, you know, backseat drive.
drive like fucking you know i don't know what, what is this like 30 years later or whatever you know but i'm like sitting there going like what if like what if they had those cards like in the movie and what if it was like oz or some shit you know what i mean where it's like you know prisoner four seven five seven five this douchebag like raped 20 girls and you know he he he, he murdered like seven guys and that's why he's on this penal colony planet like just something to like 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 kind, kind of like kind a, of, a, uh what's the then diesel movie near dark or something what was that one? oh 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 total, oh, uh, total pitch, dark pitch black? pitch black pitch black yeah pitch where, black. Where, or, or a little bit like maybe an animal house kind of thing too where you're like getting the flashes of who these guys are you actually get a sense of who they are as yeah individuals. yeah like, Which, like, of course, or, or maybe you maybe you flash back to to some of this like in, in to me I, I i guess i was thinking of oz but it's all the same shit like there's a, that moment where you like flashback and see sort of what well, what did they do to get in here like who are these guys so they're they have a little more character as opposed to what you're saying which i kind of agree with whether it's the comic adaptation or even the movie right like like when i first saw that movie like you said these were all um those those bald art you know mannequins that that people use to like draw anatomy like they and, and you just lined up eight of them you know like where you're like okay it, it, and charles dutton do you know what i mean like that that's what it was it was like fucking charles dutton sigourney weaver and like fucking eight mannequins that that, that all have bald heads right and i was well, just it, like it, 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 it's a uh, literally the antithesis of Alien because Aliens is a movie where like especially somebody like uh, going to that Aliens event and trying to get original commissions for all of the actors and people working on the movie they're going to show up for the convention and therefore doing the research to get a sense of I wouldn't have known who Spunk Meyer was if the actor didn't show up at the convention but having watched the movie and getting a sense of who these characters are so I can tell an artist what I'm looking for for the commissions or just explain to them who this character is and why the commission to be done for them there isn't a character in aliens that you can't like see that, that like you can make the action figure of that if, if you're doing the star wars kinder action figures you can make an action figure of every one of those people and have like info in the back of the car telling you who they are what they did and somebody's gonna be like oh yeah i remember that guy oh yeah i remember that scene you you can connect potentially to literally everybody in the freaking movie of aliens but especially the expanded cast you're still talking about even if you only focus on the people that folks absolutely love there's still like six to 12 people in that cast that you could legitimately be like among your favorite characters in a movie ever. Like you love all these guys. This is, I think I talked about this a little bit with Ryan. Aliens is like the GI Joe movie because you've got a a beachhead and you've got a a quick kick and you've got like all those characters get a moment so that you know who they are and you can glom onto them and, and, and you have a reason to love them where you get to alien three and it's almost like they specifically are making a point of you not loving anybody. They want they almost punish you for trying to, to have any affection for these characters because they're all bad people who did bad shit and are going to come to bad ends and it's almost like they're specifically telling you don't even bother because this is not going to end well so just don't even try and it's like they're going out of their way to make sure that you can't invest in a single fucking character in that movie I've already espoused this but I'm, I'm curious what your take on this is but I and, and I think this applies heavily to Newton Hicks as well but I mean I, I think that's all Sigourney Weaver man do you know what I mean like like I think I think she was like I want to be in this movie as long as I'm the main attraction. And how do you make her the main attraction? You surround her with a bunch of people who, just as you described, the scum of the earth, there's no reason to invest in anybody in that movie except for Sigourney Weaver. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because she's the protagonist, but like I, I kind of feel like that's what led to, you know, Newton Hicks getting quote unquote off, you know, in the, the writing stages. And that's why these other characters are not it, basically if if, if someone's ego is threat, right, then then the, the, the best way to massage that ego is to say, look, like, l- look at all these other guys. Like, nobody's going to like all these other guys. They're going to love you. That's just kind of my gut take on on how that came to be, you know, and it's like all that made by committee stuff just turned out like something that was there. Like, I just, you know, anyway, I was trying to make a point of not making the episode about the movie while it being impossible not to make the episode about the movie. Right, right. Knowing that to be the case i did try to make a point of doing a lot of research into the movie at least a fair amount of research based on what i had available you know i, I made i didn't listen to any commentary tracks i didn't watch any, any views anything like that but i tried to read a lot of like magazines and stuff from that time period and the impression that i, I was under is that i see your perspective because the, the one of the ones that people talk about a lot is her fixation with a weird sort of sexual congress with the yeah, alien yeah. which is something that ke- we kept coming back to over and over again it's like she you know we we're going to have to address this in one of these movies sooner or later because they always have to give 
a carrot to bring her back. She's never going to come back on her own. Let's be honest. There are some things that she has said or some things that she insisted upon with regard to the Alien franchise especially that were perhaps counterintuitive, that were not well received, and that because she's assigned authorship of those choices reflect badly upon her in the Alien fandom. I think we agree on that. Some of the, some of the stuff that is, is related to her in these movies seems like some weird, bizarro, freaky, fetish stuff where you're like, what the fuck are you even thinking about? Why are you well, even indulging this? And you know the reason why they indulge it is because she's Ripley and it's very much like a Charlton Heston with Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Yeah, you don't yeah, want you, to kill Taylor. You don't want to blow up the planet, but you have to have Charlton Heston come back for the sequel in their yeah. minds. And there is a little bit of that Heston quality to some of the things that have happened yeah. in the Alien franchise, specifically because of Sigourney Weaver. Excerpt from How Michael Biehn Got Axed by Sheldon Teitelbaum from the June 1992 Cinefantastique magazine. Alien 3 executive producer David Geiler said he and his producing partner Walter Hill decided to dispense with Hicks and Newt early on because they wanted Ripley operating on her own. Such a scenario, noted Geiler, offered the producers greater leeway story-wise. Geiler also said that logistics didn't favor bringing back either Bean or Hen. The original script of Alien 3 by cyberpunk writer William Gibson showed more respect for the series' characters. In Gibson's unfilmed story, young Newt is shown departing from a space station to live with her grandparents on Earth, and Bean's Hicks, as an alien, was given a strong second banana role in the action. Reading through the development process of this thing, uh, Cinefantastique in particular had a very detailed account of what all was happening and when, the timelines of stuff. And it, I think it really was a situation, infamously, they weren't confident they were going to get Sigourney Weaver back because of all the stuff that is involved with luring her back. Yeah. And so when they, the, the, while I believe that the William Gibson script has at least some of the characters from Aliens, I'm, I have not read the adaptation of his screenplay yet so oh, I'm, I'm, oh, that, I, yeah, that's that's I, next time that's my intention okay. to address that next okay. time so but i know a little bit about that but my understanding is that it, with multiple drafts they got further and further away from using ripley and at least one of the producers is talking about how the ripley character was written as a guy in the first place it, it's such a strong masculine character with masculine characteristics which is a thing that people attack nowadays like it's the literally ripley was one of the defining strong female character tropes where it's basically a male character that just happens to be played by a woman and that's a legitimate argument but that's that was already groundbreaking for the time so maybe 30 40 years later it's not it's a it's a problem back then it was the way forward okay so addressing the fact that the Ripley character was originally written as a man and wasn't really significantly rewritten when he was cast as a woman and recognizing the arc of the character they were basically like look just go ahead and write a dude and if she comes back then it'll be Ripley essentially so mm. they were doing they they kept trying to find a concept that worked for everybody and they kept trying to work around the probability seeming probability that they were not going to be able to get any of the original actors back because they were not interested in doing a movie with Hicks and Newt like the comics did. If they didn't have Ripley, they weren't going to deal with those characters at all. So I think a lot of that, if you want to indirectly, not knowing for sure they were going to secure Weaver might have been one of the reasons why they pushed those characters away. But I don't mm. see that necessarily as her fault. You know, I, I, right. that's that's good negotiating tactics is not committing to coming back and making sure you get paid. The woman got paid. Good for her, right? So I think that's part of it. But another part of it was the long development process. The fact that the original actress had aged out of the role of Newt. There, there was just a lot of ambiguity and so they got further and further away from using any of those characters and as a consequence of that they those characters left but I really don't feel like the I don't think that that was a situation where Sigourney has to take the spotlight everything I kept reading from, from the various people there was a lot of different perspectives on this they kept saying that the writers wanted to focus on the character of Ripley in part because even if they'd written a male analog or they'd written a generic action hero Ripley was going to be that hero and they, they were concerned about selling their hero they weren't really concerned about a universe of characters, especially the further along the project got. And the, the, it, it really especially, once the money's been spent, the sets have been built, we're going to go on this thing because they did not have a finished script going into this movie still. Yeah, so a, a yeah. lot of that is just like we've got Sigourney Weaver. This is the one person everybody's going to care about. This is the character we're going to have to focus on because if we don't get her across, this is going to be another failure. So I, I think a lot of it was just the circumstance and not anything about ego. Now, if you want to talk about egos, one of the people that gets zeroed in a lot too and get slammed a lot was David Fincher because going to this movie this was his first motion picture ever I think when he signed he was only 25 years old and he'd only done music videos and I think that in part they expected to be able to hire this guy and push him around since it was his first movie and to the degree that you can ever push Fincher around he got pushed around this movie which is one of the reasons why he never talks about it but also
also he was not somebody you could fuck around with and he was a force and everybody acknowledges that there so, can't believe a guy who I think by the end point was 27 that how strong he was how how demanding he was and the producers in particular kept talking a lot of shit about how this guy's making us go through 20 takes on a shot I remember when the movie was coming out I was a big fan of Premiere Magazine and I would pick that up off the stands and they had a lengthy article about the development of hell of this movie and I remember even as a kid reading how he's talking about how okay I wanted to accomplish this shot where I'm shooting through chains and it's technically very difficult and it's made for me and a handful of art school people that are going to appreciate what I'm accomplishing on that shot but I'm still going to get the shot because I want it and you know that doesn't not sound practical that that definitely sounds like burning through money needlessly necessarily but he was also a Kubrickian perfectionist which has served him well because after this of course he goes on to become one of the most revered creators of modern times a, a yeah. person who's responsible for creating numerous classic milestone works in cinema that have fucking cult followings you know it's, it's so funny because we're talking about Snyder and it's like what is that even about where even though I don't agree with the the, the mentality of a fight club fight club does present an actual worldview that you could adhere to and it's almost like an ur text for a certain mentality that Nietzschean me- mentality that makes sense that you would you would have a cultish following to a movie like that but you know he's done multiple movies like that Seven's another one where we just had the Batman come out and it's fucking what is it now 25 years since Seven and they're still like it's still like oh my god they're taking Seven and they're putting in the Batman and that's a reason for a movie to exist is we're finally getting a Batman movie that looks like Seven that's an aesthetic without you don't need to expand upon that that's all you need Seven plus Batman boom you got a movie Mm. Fincher definitely showed the world who he was and that he was somebody who could demand those things from people and it's reasonable because his his results speak for themselves but at the time this is an over budget cursed movie and they they don't know that this kid can be trusted but it's interesting reading the interviews at the time because there were people who had his back Lance Hendrickson talked about how he was brilliant he's a genius I think he called him the best director he'd ever worked with and he would 100% work with him again because he would he put the time in to make sure that we got the best performance that we developed the character and we figured out what we were going to try to present and Lance Hendrickson is another guy who's kind of a weird methody dude uh, that doesn't get talked about a lot because he's not big and famous and he doesn't send people fucking used condoms and shit um, <laughs> but but Hendrickson can can definitely be an intense person as well so for him to say that or the effects uh, crew among them Alec Gillis who had worked on uh, the original the, on Aliens and has done a bunch of other uh, projects that are of note and I, I have to say too you know humble brag I met both Hendrickson and Gillis and talked with Gillis for a while he's a good guy cool dude Gillis and, and the, his partner in the effects house they said look this guy would work the hell out of us he refused to use any of the props that had been built for aliens because he wanted to make his own movie and have his own vision and have his own take on this material and he refused to just recycle the old materials that we had but also I could see what he was going for and we made a different kind of alien for this movie we had different we, we artistically we accomplished something with this and so I, I would we would 100% work with Fincher again and he helped bring up our game and we respected him immensely so there were people who definitely had his back even then but definitely the two narratives was Weaver was a problem Finch were, was a problem and there, there may be an element of that but there also is probably some artistic integrity as well oh yeah for sure for sure excerpt from the June 1992 Cinefantastique magazine volume 22 number 6 the article has Fox bungled the franchise Alien 3 hirings firings lawsuits and storyline indecisiveness dog a studio with sequel lighters by Patrick Hobby New Zealander Vincent Ward writing with John Fasano begins with Newt dead in a hyperspace capsule as Ripley's Sulaco escape vehicle 4 crash lands on a man-made orbiter housing a religious colony of monks banished from Earth for political heresy. The five mile in circumference prison planetoid Archeon was to represent an intergalactic bastardization of life on Earth circa the Middle Ages with its many countrified layers containing churches, libraries, wheat fields, stained glass work, windmill air pumps, and dungeons. Ward's monastic order believed Earth was wiped out by a new dark age when a computer virus caused communications chaos and mass destruction. Ripley's advent is seen by the governing abbot as a double threat. Her ravings that an indestructible, death-dealing xenomorph hitches aboard her spaceship terrifies the shaved head community as much as her revelation that Earth still exists. For only the abbot knows that Archeon has planned obsolescence built into it and that their advanced 
sensing greenhouse effect, time is nearly up. The last thing the abbot wants is the status quo rocked by an unrest, forcing him to reveal his deadly secret. Thrown into the dungeons for daring to predict an alien pestilence will scourge their fragile world. The Comet Woman befriends a cyber-organic human response android, Anthony. Both are rescued by Brother John, who not only believes Ripley, but sees current events reflected in history books about the 1348 Black Death. The trio then tries to head back to the Sulaco via the air conditioning level, relentlessly pursued by the alien menace. For shock value, Ward's script relied heavily on Ripley's alien nightmares and Android Anthony's demonic visions of fish head sprites and birdmen. Elsewhere, it's fire and brimstone which carries the load as the alien threat is equated to Satanism. The revelation that a xenomorph is tattooed on the devil's posterior in a medieval engraving plays an important part in the plot. Ripley is a new age Joan of Archeon, continues the religious motifs scattered throughout the thought-provoking scenario. Ward also had the aliens taking on a chameleon-like ability to adapt to their surroundings. The first of Ward's aliens was to explode from a sheep's stomach. The woolly quadruped was dubbed the Bambi Burster by crew members and was designed by alien Oscar winner H.R. Geiger. Another was to take on the golden glow of the wheat fields. Another, a wooden appearance. For the climax, one was envisioned turning into glass. There was also to be an underwater Jaws alien. Nor was the chest the only affected body part of alien hosts. One major set piece envisioned by Ward involved a head burster. Other special effects sequences were to include an alien tail entering a monk's rectum, acid saliva spat into eyes, and bear traps causing dismemberment havoc. Not only did Ward want every single character dead at the end of his nihilistic climax for Alien 3, but he also insisted on major crew changes. But Fox decided many of Young Turk Ward's ideas, both in front of and behind the camera, were too wild and wouldn't have the broad appeal an alien sequel demanded. Ward was asked to leave the project with those oft-quoted artistic differences cited as the reason. Provided with a healthy payoff by Fox, Ward didn't seem unhappy at being shown the door. Ward has now completed the filming of Map of the Human Heart, his pet project, an imaginary love story set over 30 years, photographed from the Arctic Circle. Excerpt from Alien 3, design genius H.R. Geiger. Fox hired Geiger to create a new alien design, but stuck to using their same old thing by Jan Donz. Swiss surrealist artist H.R. Geiger was approached by the producers of Alien 3 and asked to redesign the titular creature. This time around, it had to be more animal-like, more elegant. You shouldn't get the feeling that it was a man in a suit. Basically, the head had to remain unaltered, but the body had to change. David Fincher, the director, told me I would have total freedom. I worked on it for about a month in August 1990. That was all the time I was given. But as far as I know, my designs were not used. That's disappointing. I came up with some nice improvements, even though I wasn't given too much time. For instance, the skin of the creature was designed to produce tones. It had valves on it, like a saxophone. Maybe they just ran out of money. Dark Horse Comics, who publishes a Fox licensed alien comic book series, has plans to publish Geiger's Alien 3 sketchbook containing the artist's unused designs for the film, which could be available as early as June. Plans also call for Dark Horse to publish signed and numbered limited edition posters of Geiger's Alien 3 designs, as well as sell a model of Geiger's unused Bambi Burster concept. That's why, like, when Bomb Camp, the guy from Chappie and District 9 and stuff, when he was going to do his, I'm, and I'm sick to fucking death of this shit, too, where they do the D-boots, you know, where it's like, okay, right, well, right, those right, those right, other right, three movies didn't count. Ignore. You know, we're going we're gonna to start again from the, the this movie. Fuck you. Because people invested time, money, effort to make this movie. Maybe it's not the one you wanted it to be. Maybe it didn't go in the direction you wanted it to go to. And yeah, I, every now and again, you're just like, okay, we're just going to mulligan this shit. But you don't mulligan three, four, five. Five fucking movies. Fuck you. Either do a full reboot where we're going to start again. Like Planet of the Apes. You cannot, and I've tried, you cannot mix the original Planet of the Apes with the new flavor. They take right. similar characters, similar themes, but they're too different. They go to too many different places. The, the actual construction of the aliens. I don't see Roddy McDowell Caesar being, what's his face as Caesar? Oh, Andy. Andy, Andy Circus is Caesar. Caesar. They're, these are not, these are two people playing the same, a variation on the same character, but they're not the same character and you cannot merge those two worlds. It's two different takes on the Planet of the Apes arc, right? And I, I enjoy them both. I think they're both great. I'm not I'm not mad at the movies for, for starting from scratch again and telling a, a, a new take on the same basic story. I, I think both the franchises are great. Obviously, I love the original and I like the new ones, but I'm not mad at any of them. I think you can do that, I'm, you know, I'm, but I'm the, the, the shit, Burton the shit. One. What's that? I said, I'm mad at the Tim Burton one, maybe more well, than <laughs> we, We're all mad at the Tim Burton one. Although I will say, I think that the fucking makeup effects are outstanding on 
on that. I, yeah. You know, yeah. It's, a, it's a cool movie to look at. It's just as soon as people start talking, it's like, fuck this shit. Excerpt from the May 1992 cover dated Premiere magazine by John H. Richardson. The next screenwriter on board was Greg Pruss, hired to rewrite Fasano, who had to leave to co-write another 48 hours. Pruss did five arduous drafts, he says. By this time, Warden Pruss had moved to London, where Fox was going to shoot the film in the hopes of saving money. The crew was already beginning to design and build sets even as the script was being written. But now the studio began having problems with Ward, who was less interested in Ripley or the alien than in his monks. The movie's called Alien because it's about the alien, says Pruce. I couldn't get that across to Vincent. He and the studio were at odds, clear and simple, and I was in the middle. Pruce quit, and a few weeks later, Ward was gone. Now the studio was in a real dram. It had invested somewhere between $5 million and $13 million in scripts, sets, and pay or play commitments. After strafing Hollywood in the press for paying its Rambos better than its Ripley's, and knowing that Roth would not make the movie without her, Weaver was able to negotiate about $4 million, plus a healthy chunk of the back end, then the highest salary paid to an actress. I think it's better to just say, okay, well, we're just going to either start from the beginning and we're going to recast Ripley. By the way, don't ever fucking do that. Don't. You cannot recast Ripley. There is not another Sigourney Weaver on this earth. Just don't do it. Create a new character that's like Ripley. Let the actress inhabit that character and not have to be constantly compared to Sigourney Weaver. The same way that I think it wasn't fair for Chris Pine to have to play Jim Kirk. It would have been nice if he had been a Jim Kirk-like character doing his own thing. He, he's not William Shatner. None of those actors were going to ever be as iconic as the original actors. And the fact that you got these guys that are stuck at basically doing impersonations of other actors, that's kind of fucked. I, I think that sucks. I wish they just hadn't done that. But you can do that as long as you give yourself enough license to, we're going to start from scratch. We're going to do our own thing. We're not going to worry about comparing ourselves constantly to what went before. And I think that's what, something they did very well with the Planet of the Ace movies that they don't usually do with other franchises. But the shit where you just try to say that nothing else happened and we're going to skip these other movies and we're going to start from this point, no. It, for me, it, for starters, it, it diminishes. It, it's the multiverse. It's that if, if anything can happen and you can decide that this never happened and we're going to do this thing over here, then no, none of it matters. And it, it, it just seems like foolish and delusional to do that. Those things happened. It may not be the way you wanted them to happen, but you got to accept that's the way that it was. I don't want to see Sigourney Weaver and Michael Biehn come back and do the roles again. They had their time. Let's stop living in the past and let's start telling new stories. It's one of the things that frustrates me with Star Trek is they're constantly going back and telling the stories of what happened before Kirk's crew you know, you stopped advancing the narrative with the Next Generation movies. They, they, they haven't progressed, aside from Picard. And even then, it's still a nostalgia fest because you're still going back to the same old characters. And you, it doesn't feel... There's so much treading of water. Like, I want to see what happens in the next century. You know, do what you did with Next Generation, where it's like, okay, those stories happened, but now we're going to go off, we're going to do stuff in the further future and tell new stories. Excerpt from the June 1992 Cinefantastique magazine. Has Fox Bungled the Franchise by Patrick Hobby. Scenarios contributed by a long parade of screenwriters included outrageous ideas like the aliens invading New York and fusing into a giant biomechanoid monster. Archeon is a totally wooden planetoid became a heavy metal orbiter with wood used merely as a retro camouflage. The now alien impregnated Ripley was given an ancient herbal formula to choke up the embryo before heading skyward once more with Matthias, a monk's pet dog as company, the latter a device to furnish an alien four possibility. When you talk about like the blow camp and the whole, you know, I, I, I guess what I immediately think of is all these you know rob zombie halloween and then the recent halloween movies where they i guess if you want to strictly go back to it it goes back to me learning about the differences between all the godzilla movies you know it's like you got showa era you got heisei era and then you got millennium era and by the time you got the millennium era every single movie in the millennium era was not a sequel it was a sequel to godzilla 54 right like so they were constantly as you say rebooting you know fuck that shit rebooting right but to me there, there's that weird like uh, what I rage against is there's that weird argument that you know oh DC Comics is constantly rebooting meh, 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 meh. and I always go on about it going dude fuck you Marvel did it every fucking seven years they have a sliding timeline like what uh, fucking Reed Richards and Ben Grimm going to World War II and then not is not rebooting every fucking five minutes like every all these things do that i don't know to me it's like the ripley that was in the first movie and the second movie is not the ripley that was in the third movie and to me that's its own little mini reboot even though they don't go out of their way to i don't know delineate it or or claim it or whatever but there, there's there's that certain aspect of i i guess it's why i brought up ragnarok because it, it's a thing of how much how bald does ripley have 
to be? How damaged does Ripley have to be? Self-sacrificial does Ripley have to be before she's no longer the same character that is essentially the female Rambo mama bear that said, get away from her, you bitch. And it doesn't mean I dislike Alien or Aliens a- a- anymore, right? Like, I, I, I get what you're saying. It doesn't it doesn't take away any, you know, fist pump, fuck yeah moments I have for Aliens, but it does make me incapable of l- loving Alien 3. You know what I mean? Like, I just, I, I can't, to, to me, it's like, it may be very well artistic. It may be very well that it, it helps you have a catharsis for, you know, grief or, or, or it has this metatextual concept about what it's like to go through loss in life. But you know what? I, I didn't ask for that. You know what I mean? Nobody asked for that with, with that kind of thing. So that, that I guess that's why I, you know, for me, it's an interesting, it's an interesting conversation to have. Yeah. You know? Excerpt from the May 1992 cover dated premiere magazine. My heart's like this, Weaver says, shaking your hands in the air. I had to start working on this picture and we had no script and we had no director and at best these things can be nightmares. On their short list of potential savers was David Fincher, a video director with a reputation as a hell of a shooter. Just look at the visual flash of his Madonna videos, Vogue, Express Yourself, and Oh Father, and something of a movie savant. Genius is a word many use. Son of a Life magazine reporter, he produced a local TV news show while still in high school. As a 19-year-old industrial light and magic employee, he shot some of Return of the Jedi. His first commercial was the American Cancer Society Smoking Fetus. He directed his first video at 21 and landed a CAA agent soon after. Hill and Goller had discovered Ridley Scott and James Cameron when they were virtual unknowns, so they were well disposed to hiring beginners. Fincher, it turned out, considers the first Alien one of the 10 perfect movies of all time. Proust tried to tell him he was making a mistake. I said, David, you're fucking nuts. Why are you doing this? Why don't you direct your own movie, he recalls. And he said, I don't know, there's just something cool about it. It could be cool. Don't you think it could be cool? With Fincher signed, Fox hired Larry Ferguson, who co-wrote Beverly Hills Cop 2, to do a four-week emergency rewrite. His price, about $500,000. Fincher stated, in the draft Larry was writing, she was going to be this woman who had fallen from the stars. In the end, she dies, and there are seven of the monks left. Seven dwarves. Seriously, I swear to God. She was like, what's her name in Peter Pan? She was like, Wendy. And she would make up these stories, and in the end, there were these seven dwarves left, and there was this fucking tube they put her in, and they were waiting for Prince Charming to come to wake her up. So that was one of the endings he had for the movie. You can imagine what Joe Roth said when he heard this. When Ferguson turned in his draft, the movie almost fell apart. He'd written Ripley so that she sounded like a very pissed off gym instructor, says Weaver. I said, if you're going to do this, you're going to have to do it without me. Fox coughed up another $600,000 or so for Hill and Goller to do an emergency rewrite. Again, uh, with the Nightmare movies, it's like, I didn't ask for the Dream Warriors to get killed, but I know that right, this is a franchise. Right, right. They're going to keep pumping these out for as long as they can. So I, I get it, but it didn't also didn't impact me in the same way because Alien and Aliens are arguably masterpieces. They're arguably among the best films ever created. And the fact that that was a movie and the sequel to the movie, especially with all the jokes that we have with sequels, that's a novelistic thing. It's like, no, you can actually do a sequel that meets or exceeds the original. You know, that's like the fucking God, uh, Godfather 2 type thing where it's like, oh, wow, you can actually take the story and continue it and enlarge it and expand upon it and, and tell something that's truly a piece of art instead of just a piece of commerce. But as a piece of commerce, Alien 3 is fucking horrendous and disastrous and uh, wrecks the franchise, wrecks the momentum that would be building up all those years. The, arguably, the franchise has never recovered from it. Every attempt they've tried to make to move past Ripley, and honestly, I think a big part of the problem is Resurrection, because when they went back to Ripley, I think that's where they really hurt themselves. I think that they could have started fresh without Sigourney Weaver, without Ripley, and I think that would have been much healthier. But again, she dies, and they won't let her go. It poisons the franchise as a result, because I think that there's a lot of value in the metaphor that the alien represents, and you can t- I think there's a lot of stories you can tell, because again, it's like superheroes. Superheroes isn't a genre. Superhero is an element to a mingling of all genres, potentially. You can tell alien western if you want to. I think you can do all kinds of stuff. The alien is just a manifestation of fears of the other, fears of transgression, of molestation. Alien is a, a the, the reason why I think it's so strong and so striking and why it's survived this long is because it, it's, a, it's a primordial incarnation of a bunch of things that humanity will always have to worry about, will always have to fear. And especially as we've conquered the elements, we're not afraid of wolves and bears so much anymore because they're off in the woods. We've dealt with those things. The alien is a thing that specifically has to come at us as part of its nature and it's an alpha predator. It will 
always, on a one-on-one, we always are going to lose. And we're not just going to lose our life necessarily, although that happens a lot, but we might also be violated, impregnated, raped, you know? And again, it's, there's always this, this notion of that rape is a woman thing, men get raped too, and it's not something that we deal with well with our culture. And using the metaphor of the alien, you can use these movies to, to address things like male rape that you can't do healthily to this day, in, in especially in a commercial vehicle, but you can do it in these movies. So I think the alien is an extremely valuable metaphor, and you can definitely do more stories that are that go beyond Ripley, but because the fandom was in a, in, unable to move past Ripley, and the franchise, the people who make it, the producers, the stars were unable to move past it, it became unhealthy. It became toxic, and it's never fully recovered from its inability to let Ripley go, and the whole point of Alien 3 is telling you, you have to. And I, I'd like to show the difference between Dream War, what is it, what was it, the, the Dream? Oh, Dream Master. Dream Master, thank you. The, the difference between that and Alien 3 is that, yes, it's a huge gut punch with those kill those characters, and yes, it feels disrespectful to Cameron that they, they just dispatch them off screen, but at the same time, the entire movie is about Ripley processing that. It, the, the, that's what the movie is about, is the grief over those people dying, and Ripley's grief over the circumstances of her life, so it's not a cheap thing where they're clearing the decks to tell a new story and continue the franchise. It's a recognition that you can't move past aliens, really. It's almost a, 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 a tribute to aliens because it recognizes we can't do this again. We, we're not going to be able to reach the heights of this. This is the best thing that it is. Nobody's ever going to do a better aliens than aliens. You just can't. You know, it's it's already a nigh perfect movie. That's like trying to remake Back to the Future. You can't. Don't fucking try. It's a, it's a fool's there. And, you know, so it, it, to some degree, Alien 3 is a tribute because it recognizes this. We need to end here because if we keep trying to go back to the Ripley story, we're just going to com- keep devaluing it and devaluing it. So, I, yeah, that, that, I think that's the difference between the two is I don't think that it's canny. I don't think that it's clever. I don't think that it's necessarily intending to be cruel and to disparage what came before. I think it's a recognition that you couldn't progress past that without diminishing returns. But yeah, it's definitely a fucked way to go about that. Yeah, I, it might not be intending to be cruel, but I, I feel like it ignores the symbolism of of what those characters mean, especially Ripley. So it, in effect, it is it is cruel, you know, like that. That's just I, 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 I don't mean to make this like super heavy or whatever, but you talked about, you know, you talked about the metaphor for rape. Right. And it's like to me, that's like saying, oh, look, you had a rape survivor in the second movie. Not only was there a rape survivor, but she kicked all kinds of rapist ass. And then you're telling me that in the third movie, the perfect ending to it is to have her get raped. That's how I see it. Right. And it's like, that's why that's that that crushing kind of thing where you're like, fuck, man, like that's not, you know, that that doesn't work for me. You know, and, and that's why it's that. that I, I don't know that, that that's, I guess that's why it, it's stupid. Right. It's a fucking movie. Right. But it's like, that's why you feel strongly about it, you know, because you're like, what the fuck? Like, I don't know. That's but anyway, that's well, the, Amanda that's Palmer help. is a problematic person. It, 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 well, well documented of all the ways in which he, again, in a very Sigourney Weaver kind of way, gets artsy and pretentious and pisses people off, right? She performed in a recent episode of the Samantha Bee show, Full Frontal, and she performed a song called Judy Bloom. And it was about trying to push back against all the library censorship that's going on now, all the culture war crap. And the song Judy Bloom is about basically she's talking about how she doesn't remember a bunch of the people from seventh and eighth grade. You know, they came and they went in her life. But the characters that she was introduced to through Judy Bloom's novels influenced her life going forward and are, are emblazoned in her mind. She will never forget these characters and what they meant to her and, and continue to mean to her. You know, this is a parasocial relationship. These characters are in your life in a way that perhaps real people aren't in your life. Uh, that's part of the point of art is to fill in the spaces that aren't being taken care of in, in your lived experience, you know, to, to give you experiences you're never going to have, to give you perspectives you wouldn't necessarily be exposed to otherwise. And the whole song, again, is about that. It's like, I don't, Judy Bloom's characters mean more to me than the real people that were in my life because they they impacted me and they 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 were with me when nobody else was there that kind of thing right so I and I'm a person who lives for fiction you know I'm a person who I moved around all the time and I didn't consistently have people in my life and so my friendships are with DC and Marvel comic book characters and stuff because those are the ones who are there consistently and thankfully as my life progressed I had other people come into my life that were there that did add value to my life that were healthy for me that have continued to be there you know going forward and hopefully will continue to be
be there, but that wasn't always the case. So I in no way diminish parasocial relationships. And I think the difference though is that like you look at the Star Wars fandom and the deep abiding love people have for the Skywalkers and Han Solo and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And of course you have this huge conflict. Now at this point, an intergenerational conflict because what matters more to you, the Mandalorian or Qui-Gon Jinn or, you know, there's a, there's a lot of sniping amongst people who uh, imprinted yeah, on yeah. this set of characters versus this set of characters. Yeah. But at, at the end of the day, Star Wars, it makes sense to do that because it is a generational saga. It makes sense that some people are going to feel more strongly about one set of characters versus another set of characters. But also because it's a science fantasy story, there is an expectation, a reasonable expectation that this is going to continue to be hopeful, that it's going to continue to move forward, that there'll be a generation after the last generation, and that you're going to be able to have these characters in your lives forever. You might be mad that they eventually killed off Han Solo, but the Han Solo that you had adventures with in the 1970s and 80s is still there. The, the, the books are still on the shelves, right? I think the difference is that Alien is a horror science fiction franchise, and you can do the happy ending for a horror franchise, which is what we got for the first two Alien movies, relatively speaking. It wasn't a happy ending if you were anybody else on the Nostromo besides the cat and the chick, right? Right. Um, right. But I don't know that it's reasonable to expect to get to the third chapter of a horror franchise defined by mass slaughter and expect it to, to end on the on a high note, you know? And I'm not saying that you don't deserve that. Again, this is the thing that wrecked the franchise, you know? I just also understand why you would necessarily end it the way they ended it. I, I'm not saying that there aren't other endings that couldn't have been healthy and, and happy. I just don't know that in a horror franchise, it's necessarily the wrong way to go to end on the down note because, yeah. you know, yeah. it, that's part of what horror is about is facing the things in life that aren't pleasant and aren't leaving you in a happy place and that yeah sometimes the, the somebody gets past the trauma and sometimes they end up killing themselves because they can't get past the trauma and I think inherent in horror is going to places that you really can't go into with any other genre so I think it fulfills uh, what Alien is supposed to be to, to go to those places because they always did transgress they always did go further than other people did that's part of what defined Alien is like holy shit there's a chest burst coming out of these people nobody's not even the cast knew that was coming with the blood right. splattering on their faces and we were seeing the legitimate reaction that they did not know that was coming I, 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 if you're going to continue in that vein you're going to have to be willing to go to the place that people don't want you to go and it's not commercially correct but I think it's artistically valuable I think it is an artistic integrity I, and I respect given how like look at Marvel you know yeah I, 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 I can respect that they, Tony Stark appears to be dead Steve Rogers is off in the multiverse somewhere with an alternate version of Sharon Carter. They have an element of finality to them, but you know inherent in the Marvel model is they can turn around and go to the multiverse and come up with the new Steve Rogers, the new Tony Stark. They're so far indicating that they're going to move on to a Riri Williams, Sam Wilson. They're, they're showing that they're currently going with a generation model, but if that doesn't work out, you know that they're going to eventually go back to the default, right? I have to respect the willingness to say, no, everything's horrible. All these people die. This is the end. We're not progressing with this particular story from here because that that is so not in line with where we are as a culture right now. And one of the things that I, I, I again, you t using the Ragnarok example. Well, a, if you go back to the original Ragnarok, it's all about those people dying and never coming back again. You know, the, the actual mythological. Well, yeah, yeah, that's, it's the end but, of the but story. They, but in the case of the Marvel Ragnarok, it's all about it's the end of some character stories, but they don't matter. We're gonna check out how cool Valkyrie is. You know, hey, look at this yeah. great gag that Grandmaster's doing. It's like, can I have a minute to deal with the fact that you just killed off all these people that right. we spent these other two movies with and that even if the movies failed to connect a mass audience to those characters there are people who were reading those comic books for 50 years that maybe do give a shit about those guys I'm not a Thor guy but I understand that there are Thor guys out there and I don't want them getting their characters hosed in that fashion and disposed of them that way and I, I much more respect how Alien 3 dealt with killing off characters that people care about versus the way Ragnarok did it I much prefer the, the Alien model because that I think it's traumatic but there's an element of, of, of healthy progress there where Ragnarok is just completely just like oh those people didn't matter don't worry about it we're gonna go have fun with, let's go to the party you know it's it's Vanessa Hudgens bitching about Coachella during the COVID pandemic it's like that's not healthy that's not beneficial to mankind you know that, that's just some fucking Marie Antoinette bullshit yeah now now I have images of 
I don't know, like Ripley jamming to uh, whatever they were playing in the Ragnarok. Uh, oh, the, uh, the, the, the Mark Brothers Bo uh, Electronica? Yeah. You can see it. I don't know. Excerpt from the 2019 hardcover edition of Alien 3, the unproduced screenplay, part of 20th Century Fox Uncovered. The introduction, Work for Hire, written by William Gibson out of Vancouver, British Columbia, January 23rd, 2019. The screenplay this series was based on was my first attempt at writing one, something I never considered prior to it being commissioned by the Alien franchise's three producers. It was also my first experience of executing a work for hire, a piece of fiction of sorts to order that wouldn't be my intellectual property. I'm fairly certain that I'd never read a screenplay before being sent the shooting scripts for the first two Aliens films. I certainly hadn't read a treatment before, and I was sent one of those as well, quite detailed, written by the producers Walter Hill, David Geiler, and Gordon Carroll. I wasn't a member of the Writers Guild, but as a non-member, you're allowed to write a single first contract screenplay to a Guild-approved contract, it being understood that your next one will be written as a member. I read the two screenplays in the treatment, met with the producers, and went home to write. Almost immediately, the Writers Guild went rather spectacularly on strike. As a sort of honorary member, I gathered I was expected to down tools, not that I'd yet picked any up, and not communicate with my employers, which I did, though I then found myself with an indefinite amount of time in which to study those screenplays, which proved crucial. It seemed to me that if I considered those as the first two volumes of a trilogy and attempted to write a third like them, I'd have my best shot at not looking like someone who'd never before imagined writing a screenplay. Not that I intended to wrap anything up to provide the end of any grand arc, but simply that I wanted to write something that would feel as much as possible like the missing third of a triangle. The other thing I had in my favor, I felt, was that I was very much a fan of those previous films. They'd both affected my sense of what sci-fi prose could do, let alone sci-fi film, as had Blade Runner and Escape from New York. And the treatment, the screen story, was very carefully and thoughtfully written. I wouldn't, given my druthers, have written Ripley out, though the treatment did. On the other hand, the whole space Marxist aspects was something I wouldn't have thought of, but which I took too enthusiastically. After Ripley, my favorite character in the first two films had been Bishop, so I decided to crank my Bishop up for volume three. And eventually I did, hand formatting the whole thing on my brand new Apple IIc, a hideous chore, as I had no idea of final draft, if indeed that even existed then. Having submitted the result and receiving a response, I then, to terms of my contract, produced a second draft, and thereafter, for whatever reasons, ceased to be involved. I've since read that the producers had given it to me, not in hope getting a serviceable screenplay, but hoping for a certain amount of what might be called cyberpunk flash, which might then be laminated into someone else's actual screenplay. But I confounded their expectations doubly, first by turning in what they seemed to have regarded, to their surprise, as a somewhat serviceable screenplay, but also by turning in one devoid of whatever exciting new flavor they were hoping for. They simply hadn't, I imagine in retrospect, expected me to be quite so big an alien fanboy. And their thing sat for literal decades until Dark Horse decided to publish a series based on that screenplay, something that never would have occurred to me, not least because the screenplay isn't my intellectual property. This brought on board the remarkable Johnny Christmas, whose adaptation of the screenplay to this medium is no doubt far more sensitive to the screenplay's intentions than any feature film would likely ever have been. It's been a really peculiar pleasure watching this story unfold as drawn by Johnny Christmas, who also literally adapted it from screenplay to comic script. It looks better than I imagined it. The characters are more emotionally expressive than I imagined them, quite hauntingly so, and it moves in a way that far exceeds any expectations I may have had for it as a film, which it always seemed quite a long shot anyway. Thank you, Johnny, and thank you, Dark Horse. The work for hire has finally found a home. Plot synopsis taken from Xenopedia. Following the disastrous mission to Acheron, the Sulaco is on its return journey to Earth. However, the vessel strays into space controlled by the Union of Progressive Peoples, leading a team of three UPP commandos to intercept and board it. Within, the commandos discover a xenomorph egg that has grown from the severed upper torso of Bishop as he slumbers in his hypersleep capsule. Almost immediately, a facehugger bursts forth and attacks the commando's leader, Kurt. He stumbles away as he struggles with the creature, while his comrades Chang and Wan are forced to abandon him and escape the ship before it leaves UPP space, taking Bishop's torso with them. The Sulaco continues onward to Anchor Point Space Station, where it is immediately quarantined. <sighs> Which is it? Tully, Charles A. Tech 5 Tissue Culture Lab. Tully, wake up, you lazy son of a bitch. Okay, shithead, I'll punch the code in for you. Ah! Is, that, is that good? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, oh, yeah? Yes! <sighs> What the fuck? Damn you, Tully! Jackson! Is that Spence in there under you? Oh, shit. Get off me, Tully. <sighs> it's the middle of my downtime, okay? I don't think you were sleeping. Downtime's downtime, Jackson. Show me in the regs where it says I can't do this. 
If I show you in the regs where it says you don't disconnect the comm unit in this cubicle, Tully, I'll have to dock you a month's pay. I don't expect to have to drag myself down here from Ops Room to fetch a biolab tech. You two Spence. What's the big deal? Before Sulaco turned up, we docked a priority shuttle out of Gateway. Two passengers. Military science. That's the bad news? They want that ship gone over for biohazard contamination. The full drill by 0800 hours. Your priority for the squad, Tully. <sighs> Come on! And Spence, you can help out the senior scientists and collect the company officials from the docking bay. <sighs> More bullshit. A search of the skip is ordered by Wayland yutani executives Fox and Wells, who have recently arrived at Anchor Point to investigate the cause of the navigational error that caused the ship to strain to UPP territory. However, the station's commanding officer, Rossetti, privately sheds doubt on the purpose of their mission. Kevin Fox. Susan Wells. Welcome to Anchor Point. Coffee? No, thanks. We appreciate the demands we're making on your operation, Rossetti. Things have been on hold here for a while. Coffee, Miss Wells? Something without caffeine. Could you get us some coffee, Spence, and something without caffeine? Yes, sir. Okay, according to our data, you departed Gateway three days prior to the navigational failure that sent Sulaco into the UPP sector. Hmm, let's consider that a glitch in your documentation. But your orders say you're here to investigate accidental failure in the ship's navigational system. If it was accidental, how did you manage to leave Gateway before it happened? Not to worry. I'm the senior scientist on this station, Miss Wells. I'll decide that for myself. If I were you, I'd worry about the mission priority rating on those orders. That's the two-digit figure in the upper right corner, page one. I think this software failure was a command from Gateway. Rosetti, that isn't in the documentation. You caused the failure, deliberately rooted Sulaco through the UPP sector, and brought her into Anchor Point. We didn't say that. We're with military sciences. Yes, I saw the passenger manifest from your shuttle. Weapons division? I wasn't informed of that. Coffees and a juice. Thanks, miss. You're welcome. The presence of Weapons Division personnel on Anchor Point is specifically forbidden by our Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty with the United Progressive Peoples. This isn't a military station. We understand that. We appreciate your concern. You're violating treaties that exist to prevent nuclear war. You've deliberately caused an armed military spacecraft to penetrate their border zone. If they can prove it... They know. Proving it is something else. They boarded Sulaco. We logged a security breach. We can certainly prove that if we have to. If that's true, <laughs> someone is crazy. Believe me, Colonel, the decision was made at the top. The top of what? Sulaco was returning to Gateway with specimens of weapons-related material. The company's quantum detectors were monitoring data from the ship's hypersleep vault. It became evident that the material in question had become active. The decision was made to reroute Sulaco here to Anchor Point. Other factors outweighed the risk of entering UPP territory. But I wasn't consulted. Is there a status report yet on the biohazard sweep we requested? <sighs> Looks like we have a crew assembling in Docking Bay 8. You'll be going aboard yourselves? We're in charge. <sighs> we wouldn't have it any other way. Can you have your chief mechanic meet us in the Docking Bay with a loader? There's equipment in our shuttle that needs lifting out. Very well. Rossetti's appalled, but his superiors on Earth order him to bow to Fox and Wells' demands. The sweep of the ship is carried out by the station's biotech team, including colleagues and lovers Spence and Tully, accompanied by Fox and Wells. Tully, Sterling, hypersleep vault. Stay tight. This is creepy. Charging the laser rifle. There's a lot of damage on this deck. Melted plating, scratches, grids ripped up, and one of the power loaders is missing. Looks like some kind of fight. But these aren't laser burns. Maybe there are clues in the crew quarters. Can you get that over a little? <sighs> There's a child in this one. Little girl. Cute. Shit. Look at this. Somebody been firing shots in here. Looks to be. We got a Marine Corporal in this capsule. This one's probably dead. A female. 30s, I'd say. What a waste. No! 
Holy fuck! No. No. Starling. No, no! Life no! no! Got her! No. Newt? <sighs> Man. Get her and the others back to med lab. They recover the remaining survivors on board, although Fine Ripley has lapsed into a coma as a result of accidental damage caused to her cryo tube by the commandos. Bishop's severed legs are retrieved, while Fox and Wells also discover the body of Kurtz, his chest burst open. Back aboard Anchor Point, the Wayland yutani executives debrief Hicks and Newt, swearing both to silence regarding events on Acheron, and also order Spence and Tully to begin examining biological samples recovered from Bishop's leg. You can't smoke in here, Corporal Hicks. Yes, ma'am. Why haven't I been debriefed? Hey, stop! Ow! God damn it! The kid bit me! No! Don't touch me! Oh, don't <clears throat> touch her! Where's Ripley? She's asking you a question. You looking to get yourself sedated, Corporal? Where is she? Now I'm asking you the question. Rebecca, Newt, honey, it's it's okay. Ripley's gonna be okay. Come now. I'll take you. You can see her. Spence, Fox's orders. Screw Fox. Let her see Ripley. See? She's sleeping. But we're awake. Sometimes people need to sleep to get over things. What are those wavy lines? It's the brain activity monitor. Is Ripley dreaming? I don't know, honey. It's better not to. Meanwhile, on the UPP space station Rodina, scientists are developing xenomorph material recovered from the other half of Bishop's body. Having concluded the Anchor Point crew will be doing the same. Aware of their experiments violates arms reduction treaties between the two powers, diplomatic officer Rivera elects to have Bishop repaired and return to Anchor Point to buy them time to work. Mr. Fox. You put a call for me through ops. You ordered us to run Test Series 10C on the material recovered from the android's chest cavity. Yes. That includes a standard compatibility run on human DNA. Then do it, Tully. Did it. Impossible. Minimum cultivation period is 53 hours. You need to see something, Fox. Spence, the hologram unit, please. Sure. What's that for? We'll run a simulation of the test results. Light, Spence. Check. Okay. Watch the hollow display double helix. I know this one. Yeah, human DNA. Okay, here comes the other. Where? The structure on the right-hand side. The green and red beads. It's the alien genetic code. Now we bring it into contact with the human DNA. Good grief. The alien code pulls itself into the double helix. The two structures mesh. A hybrid results. What's the real-time duration on this? That was it, Fox. What what you see, that's what you get. It's that fast. Which is why we terminated the test run. You what? You saw what that shit does to human genetic material. You want to be put on report, Spence? Look, this stuff is too hot to handle without a major containment facility. Tully, this station is our containment facility. Jesus. It's happened much faster than we anticipated. You did it. This is it. Yes, Nevsky. It's tiny. Yesterday, it was microscopic. Now, it's visibly an embryo. Irony. Irony? Colonel Doctor? The readiness with which it lends itself to genetic manipulation. The speed with which its cells multiply. Yes, remarkable. As though the gene structure had been designed for ease of manipulation. And this apparently universal compatibility with other plasms. I don't understand. It's the fruit of some ancient experiment. A living artifact. Look. Just look at it. Perhaps we are looking at the end result of someone else's arms race. On Anchor Point, the decontaminated Sulaco is cleared to return to Earth after a damaged cooling unit is replaced, and the vessel takes Newt with it. Sulaco mainframe, this is Anchor Point Operations Room. Status update? Sulaco autopilot departure coordinates in place. Destination, Gateway Station, Earth. Docking umbilical, ready to uncouple. Biohazard sweep, negative. Cooling grid repair status. Positive. 
Copy that. The Sulaco's leaving in 10 minutes. Last call for Sulaco crew and anchor point evacuee. The ship is ready to depart for gateway. That's you. Okay. Hey, Newt. Corporal Hicks. Holiday. I'll get Newt aboard the Sulaco and tucked in. If that's okay with you, Newt. Yes, I'd like that. Great. Listen, good luck in Oregon. Hicks? Yeah? Affirmative. Go on. You be sure to tell me when Ripley wakes up. Make sure and show her how to find Oregon. Bye. Salago, you are clear of the docking gate and cleared for departure. Copy, Anchor Point Station. Engaging thrusters. Meanwhile, an accident in the lab exposes Tully and Wells to xenomorph genetic material. As a result, Tully and Spence are removed from the project and Bishop is placed in charge of the experiment. Shortly afterward, the technician responsible for cleaning up following the accident is killed by the xenomorph drone born on the Sulaco, which was unintentionally brought aboard Anchor Point within the damaged cooling unit. Concerned by the ongoing experiments, Spence informs a horrified hick. These tunnels are part of the new build just under Anchor Point's construction zone. There's only a handful of us left in the station. Why come all the way out here? These surveillance cameras aren't powered up yet. Tatsumi, just tell me what this is all about. Somebody wants to talk in private. That's all I know. Through here. Spence? Halliday? Hi, Hicks. Where's Tully? Uh, couldn't find him or Stalling. Anybody want to tell me why I'm here? Spence didn't want you in on this, Hicks, but I talked her into it. We have to stop them. Stop who? Fox and Wells ordered recumbent DNA experiments run on the alien tissue samples. The recovered alien tissue samples from Salako. What? They're cloning it. Jesus. We have to destroy the cultures now. But they'll know who did it. It doesn't matter, Tatsumi. You're right. But Tully and I have been taken off the project. They put Bishop in charge. The android bishop? The UPP rebuilt him at Rodina Station, brought him back today. The UPP gave back Weyland Yutani's lost property? Your guess is as good as mine, Corporal. We want you to walk into the tissue lab with us and help us fry that shit dead. How about it? Hicks? I'm in. How about you, Tatsumi? I don't know. It's not my kind of thing. Just keep my nose clean. Do the job. Tatsumi, she's right. Only she doesn't know how right. Because she's never seen these things. I have. Let's go. <sighs> Shit. They go to the lab to destroy the sample. Bishop, open up. Hicks. Hey, you okay? I was returned. I assume the UPP had no further use for me. Spence says they've recovered alien tissue from the Salako. Who is Spence? I am. Oh. Halliday. We've met? Yes, we have. My memory is unimpaired. Bishop, Weapons Division intends to develop the alien. Yes, one of the creatures hit aboard the dropship. It emerged when we docked with the Salako. It was larger than the others. A queen. Ripley killed it. No shit. Good for her. But it deposited genetic material in the ship. Material that is being developed into embryonic status in these tubes. Will and Yutani are stone cold crazy to be doing this. Not just them. Not from what I saw on Rodina Station. The UPP might try the same for themselves? Given the current arms race, it's entirely logical to assume that they are already doing so. Well, we're not just gonna sit and watch. We're here to destroy the embryos. But the company will know who is responsible. We don't care. We have to destroy them. I was about to do it myself. The responsibility would have been mine alone. What's stopping you? Hicks knocked at the door, so I answered it. Yeah, okay, so how do we do this? Access sterilization program. Stasis tube microwave sterilization accessed. Are you sure you want to do this? Enter password to confirm. Do it. Password entered. Commencing sterilization. The amnio looks like dirty dishwater. Can't see any embryos. They're dead. Open it. Open it now. Open the door. Anybody want to get that? 
I'll do it. God damn you, Spence! Ugh. Hey, back off, lady! Seriously? Is this how this is going to go down, Rosetti? No, I abhor violence. I only regret not having helped you. We're gonna break you for this. The company's going to bury you, so. She's having a seizure. What the fuck is this? I don't know. She was in here earlier with Tully. They were both exposed to an embryo. Her arms! These appear to be biomechanical tendons. She's just turning into one? Metamorphosis. So it seems. It's gross. An airborne breeding process triggering some kind of parthenogenesis. She got infected. Rosetti, get away from her. I can't get past. Is she even human? Not anymore. She's a fucking alien. Rosetti, move! We can't let it take Rosetti. He's dead. Let it go. Although they are successful, they are immediately apprehended by Rosetti and Wells, the latter of whom suddenly transforms into a xenomorph hybrid, the result of her exposure in the earlier accident. The creature kills Rosetti before fleeing with his body. In the aftermath, Spence goes to search for a similarly infected Tully, finding he has locked himself in a freezer to kill himself before he could transform like Wells. The survivors regroup in the station's command center, discovering it has been largely destroyed by Fox in an attempt to stop anyone calling for help or revealing Waylon yutanis experiments. Fox also destroys the station's escape pods, but not before Hicks managed manages to launch a still comatose Ripley to safety in one of them. Faced with this new xenomorph threat, Hicks is shocked to learn that the only weapons on anchor point are a suit gun with just five rounds remaining and a few grenades that were captured along with Kurtz's body. After arming up, he proposes they overload anchor point's reactor to destroy the station. His extreme solution is backed up when the survivors see the UPP destroy Rodina to contain the experiments that have similarly spiraled out of control there. The survivors formulate a plan to escape on a maintenance craft and hope to hold out until a rescue ship arrive. When Bishop goes to set the reactor, the survivors make perilous trek across the station to the docking bay, attacked by the hybrid along the way. Upon reaching their destination, Hicks discovers Fox, cocooned alive inside his ship by the drone, and ends his suffering with a grenade. As the survivors prepare to evacuate, they are attacked once again by hybrid. Suddenly the drone from the Sulaco appears and attacks the creature, tearing it in half, before turning on the survivors. Only Hicks, Spence, and Bishop make it aboard the maintenance truck alive. That thing's nearly on us! Damn it, this thing's overheating! It's lost its footing, but it grabbed on the deck rail. Hicks, get us out of here. God damn it. Full power. We're free. Door's fully open, but it's not clear. The destructive. Come on. I can't. What? There's something outside blocking the main airlock. This is Commander Chang of the Union of Progressive Peoples Armed Collective. Are you the only survivors? While the drone is killed by Chang, who arrives just in time in a UPP interceptor, having escaped Rodina before its destruction. She evacuates the others shortly before Anchor Point detonates. As the survivors await rescue, Bishop determines that Hicks and Spence are not infected, while informing them that Chang is dying of radiation poisoning following the destruction of Rodina. As a rescue ship approaches, Bishop suggests the opposing superpowers now have a common enemy in the Xenomorph, perhaps giving them the opportunity to cease their conflict and unite for a greater cause. She's passed out. What do we do? Nothing we can do. She's dying. Radiation poisoning. Anything we can do? No. Unless... Unless? You can be a species again. United against a common enemy. That. The source, Hicks. You'll have to trace them back. Find their point of origin. The first source. This goes far beyond interspecies competition. The alien is to biological life what antimatter is to matter. <laughs> You're at war. War to extermination. The alien knows no other mode. Been at war all my life. With Chang and her kind. That's what got us into this shit in the first place. But now you've seen the enemy. So has Chang. She's not it. Neither are you. What's that? <clears throat> Attention occupants of UPP interceptor craft. This is the USS Kansas City. We are grappling you into our hold. Prepare to be boarded. Do not offer resistance. Hmm. She's ahead of schedule. Bishop. Corporal Hicks? 
Can we keep Chang alive long enough to open a dialogue with her people? Stand by to be boarded. We can try. Star Wars is one of the most important licensed properties in comic book history. The 1970s movie adaptation and subsequent continuation helped to save Marvel Comics from bankruptcy in the 1970s. It was instrumental in Dark Horse Comics' success and expansion in the 1990s, and since its return to Marvel in the 20-teens, has been a significant publishing concern there. Imagine what it was like for Archie Goodwin in 1981 as he realized that the second film in the franchise, The Empire Strikes Back, had painted him into a corner. At the end of that film, everybody's first or second favorite main character had been removed, and the status quo between the lead protagonist and the antagonist was forever altered. Nothing much could be done to advance the property from that point until the resolution of its cliffhanger, except you were responsible for a daily newspaper strip and a monthly comic book for the two-year gap in between movies. Ultimately, the only thing to be done was to keep the wheel spinning as entertainingly as possible through fake-outs, bottle episodes, and side quests. William Gibson's Alien 3 isn't much of a sequel, but more of a stopgap. At some points in the film's development process, a third and fourth feature were simultaneously in the works from different writers, each planning to go forward with or without the lead characters. This screenplay feels like a deferral while awaiting a later, more relevant installment. I couldn't help thinking while reading it that this would have been a solid first arc for an ongoing comic book series, the sort of thing you would have expected in 1988, instead of the sweeping developments of the initial Verheiden Nelson miniseries. That first comic story was the sort of unwieldy, budget-busting idea storm that was probably expected from Gibson when the producers approached him for a screenplay. Gibson owes too much to the original film, with a plotting novelistic pace that retreads familiar ground. The action in the latter third is too hyperkinetic by comparison, trying to cram Jim Cameron's second act into Ridley Scott's third reel. The cast is far too expansive with too little development and not much to do as individuals. They're more idealistic and proactive than the crew of the Nostromo, but almost entirely lack their personality. There are ostensibly two African-American lead characters, although I suspect this was a modern choice in the adaptation and has no bearing on the story. One makes a heroic sacrifice and the other is more or less the Ripley stand-in. In the audio adaptation, they give Michael Bean some of her lines to expand his role, but it's notable how no sequel in any medium ever sees Hicks as strong enough to carry the core narrative. Newt's being shipped off to her unseen grandparents before the action starts ensures the safety of both herself and the script. Nothing of consequence will happen to anyone of consequence, especially once Ripley is randomly shoved into another life pod. The cartoonish Marxist oppositional government offers only the vaguest allusion to Cold War tensions, while the hybrid alien makes little impression. Its design is too similar to Geiger's, with only a slight nod to the much maligned one ultimately seen in Alien Resurrection. The transformation of the humans into hybrid aliens is lifted entirely from body horror anime like Akira, which itself was heavily inspired by the likes of Geiger and Cronenberg. The classic alien drone dispatches the hybrids so easily that it's like a metaphorical dismissal of the contrivance's existence within the script. It makes the silly animal variations from the Kinder action figures seem comparatively graceful. My review of the screenplay here is harsh because of who was responsible and how it was intended to be used. As a comic book, it's fine. It does a better job of sidelining the core franchise characters than Vera Hyde managed, while keeping their relatively brief appearances more consistent with her portrayal in Cameron's Aliens. It continues the themes of the prior movies without serious alteration and sets up a team of potential successors who perform well enough to be of interest in seeing them further developed in a comic series. Johnny Christmas is a solid artist and storyteller for an independent publisher, though he's no competition to the Murderer's Row Dark Horse Mustard in their early days. It would have been a solid enough series launch for a licensed property in between the second and third Alien films. DC Comics wishes they could have done something like this in that period. And mature readers elements aside, Marvel more or less did. But also, I'm not so sure it would have have managed the heat the actual Dark Horse comics generated by doing things that were daring and controversial with exciting art finds that are still talked about decades on. Since you're listening to the show, you know that I started doing that thing where like name, rank, and serial number. You know, it's like, what, right, right. what do, do you want an assignment within the alien universe? Sure. I mean, go ahead and do do what, what however you see fit. No, 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 no. Well, what do you see yourself as? Because like you're pretty invested in the alien universe. Are you, you know, part of the crew? of the Nostromo? Or are you a colonial marine? Are you a robot? Are you the cat like Siskoi? Like, what, where, where do you fit into this whole thing? Am I the cat? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, I'm, uh, let's see, aliens. Uh, uh, I uh, Yeah, make, make me a big muscle-bound uh, colonial marine general who everybody hates or something. I don't oh, know. Oh, so you're, you're the dude from the uh, book two then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. There you go. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that. Why not? <laughs> you're, uh, what's his face? Um, God, I can't remember his name. General George, George, uh, Yeah, yeah. You're George C. Scott in Doctor Strange Love, yeah, yeah. but transplanted to the alien universe. Okay, I can there go with you go. that. Yeah, yeah. I can, I can do that. That'll work. <laughs> 
As you've likely noted, I had not read William Gibson's Alien 3 prior to talking to Derek William Crabb. We instead had a about two and a half hour long conversation on just the film Alien 3 and the comic book adaptation of that. And I thought that it might be best to just go ahead and break that conversation up into two and cover the William Gibson book on my own. You may of course be curious about Crabb's take on that book. He already covered that on his own podcast, The Fan Holes Comic Book Motherfuckers Do You Read Them, number 50. Uh, he and his pals will uh, cover that book. You can click on a link on the blog to get to that podcast. 21st Century Boys, Between the Pages blog, Bill at Spy Vinyl, Billy Hines, BotTalk.com, CH, Cactus Comics and Cinema, Canoes, Chris A. Field, Otherverse Games, Chris Dunford, who added, well, there's a couple of new artworks for the office wall relating to some Kelly Jones pieces that were on the Twitter. Chris Lydon, Dear Watchers, a Marvel What If podcast, Del Dracula, Doc Strange, Dirk Ashton, Ed Moore, History of Comics on Film, I Was Joe Is, Jeffrey Brown, They Them, Joe M. Sontag, King Size Comics, Giant Size Fun Podcast, Kirk Spencer, Demented Old Circus Monkey, Lamar the Revenger, Lee C. Conley, Mark Wilkins, Max. Uh, Max Cage, Mike at Rihanna Mike, Mike at Send Aliens to Me, Ryan Daly, Siskoid, Ted the Sanctioned Salus, Thomas Howard Riley, Mad Scientist of Epic Fantasy, Tomas Corsi, Wayne Burroughs, and One Woman Warrior for Peace podcast. Billy Hines added, This will be another cracker, again, regarding the Aliens Hive episode. Really well produced deep dive on Dark Horse Aliens comics with a lot of found media like period TV ads and audiobooks, interviews, etc. Highly recommended. This has been the Roald Spine Podcast. All audio samples are believed covered under fair use laws. No copyright infringement is intended. Coming in May. <laughs> Alien 3. <laughs> With guest Derek William Crabb.